Hi there, it's Marla from Narrate. As we begin week one of the ninth year here at Narrate, Adam asks what if it's easy to misunderstand the success of the people and organizations you admire? What if it's one thing to have a dream and quite another to translate the dream into a daily work ethic? Enjoy as we celebrate the vision of our ninth year. Hey, good morning. Not, not going to lie, the environment that the band and tech and arts and that whole world is starting to create is starting to give me an inferiority complex. <laughs> Pre- pretty awesome. One of, my, one of my friends from the baseball world uh, started to be a part of our gatherings, and I was talking to him this week, and he's like, Adam, you walk in the door, and the music's incredible, and then it's a different person on the stage every weekend, but they're always incredible. So uh, for those of you who are part of that team or who sacrifice because your spouse is a part of that, the band team and the tech team, thank you. I, I know that it comes at the great expense of time, uh, but I do think it's, uh, hopefully it's worth your while because I know it's worth ours. So Tony Dungy, uh, you may know him. My wife always notes his long fingers on Sunday Night Football. Uh, Tony Dungy, when he was hired to be the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had experienced 13 consecutive losing seasons. So he was hired by a team who for 13 years uh, was so inept that they couldn't win more games than they lost for over a decade. That means like kids at our middle school program, like some of them, they were alive longer than this team had won a game there for for, for a big section of their existence as a team. So when he took over, uh, being the great leader that he is, he he wanted to start understanding what was going on there. And so he began to have uh, meeting after meeting after meeting, especially with players that he knew he would carry over onto the new roster in his first year. He wanted to understand what what they understood to be uh, the culture problem. And after he was done and done these kind of unnamed number of meetings, he later comprised four answers, four themes to the answers he received. The first, it was pointed out to him, their stadium was old, fans didn't like it, and therefore they didn't have home field advantage. So he thought, okay, that's easy, we need to build a new stadium. Second, uh, they noted that they didn't have a superstar. And they insisted, uh, player after player, that we need that one superstar who will raise the water level of everybody else on the team. He said, okay, go find a superstar. That's harder than building a new stadium. Third, they noted to him that they played football in Florida. And it would seem that the general consensus was a team who who trains in the summer and, and fall in Florida has a really hard time winning games in places like Green Bay and Buffalo in December and January. So he thought, okay, we'll relocate the NFL to the state of Florida. Fourth uh, was what they called, what he called the curse of Doug Williams. Now, those of you football fans, sorry, lots of sports this morning. Come back next week and we'll talk about ballet. Uh, (laughs) But but, not dissing on ballet either. Uh, But Doug Williams was was a quarterback who was drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. His first year, uh, they were horrible. The next three years, they had winning seasons. Those were the last three seasons. What started after those four years of Doug Williams' uh, tenure was 13 consecutive seasons. They lost Doug Williams because this was before free agents in the NFL. It was before salary caps or any of the players' union had much uh, say at all. Doug Williams was the only African-American quarterback, starting quarterback in the NFL. And after his fourth year, he was due for a new contract. And and the contract was being offered that was being offered him was grossly less than every other starting quarterback in the NFL. So he and the owner had a bit of a thing. They couldn't agree on a price. So Doug Williams called his bluff and went to an upstart new league that ultimately failed. He went and played quarterback for a team in Oklahoma. Now, of course, some of you will remember that Doug Williams' one good game for the rest of his career happened to be against the Broncos in the Super Bowl. And he won the MVP, not really, but he did come back and play for the Redskins. And his noteworthy moment was the Super Bowl where he played out of his mind and made John Elway look silly. So the curse of Doug Williams was that after he left, a local witch doctor literally pronounced a curse on the organization, and it turns out they hadn't had a winning season since. So those were the four things. Tony Dungy took all their ideas and facts into consideration, and and, and in his early meetings, he began uh, to introduce a new culture. He said, teams who win the Super Bowl consistently consistently do three things, and this is what we're going to focus on, he said. They they win in the turnover, turnover margin. Teams that win the Super Bowl are almost always at or at, uh, near or at the very top of the list of teams who, who take the, way, the ball away and don't give it away on offense. And so he said, we're going to work on that. We're going to work on not giving it away when we have it. We're going to work on taking it away when we don't. Number two, he noted that teams who win the Super Bowl, they're consistently among the very best when it comes to penalize, penalties. They're always among the least penalized teams. So he said, we're going to learn to play the game fair. So we're going to do that, we're going to do that. And then number three, he said that teams that win the Super Bowl, they always have superior special teams. 
So there's these few plays a game that seem innocuous. The players on the field then aren't the ones with the big contracts, but he said kickoffs and punts and field goals, those teams that win there consistently win the most. So obviously what he was talking about was culture, right? And many of you, whether it's your home or your family or business or your classroom, you, you know that culture is it's a big deal. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to talk a little bit about our culture, narrate culture. Not because I think it's broken. In fact, just the opposite. But because this is week one of year nine, and I think to whatever degree we've been successful, it has lots and lots to do with the culture that you all have created. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't pay attention to that and keep carrying that. Which means, for those of you who are guests... Uh, maybe a friend or family member or a neighbor has is, is invited you and promised they'll buy you Park Ave when you're done. Uh, it, it means that, that I've caused them to overpromise because typically what we focus on is we want to we do gatherings and we take great pride and probably the reason uh, that you've showed up here is you've heard that we work really hard to create an environment where what we can do is create a conversation that's helpful and challenging to life and marriage and emotion irrespective of what you do with Jesus at this juncture in your life. We believe that following Jesus makes your life better and makes you better at life, and that Jesus isn't threatened by the idea of being helpful before he's being worshipped. We think that, that when you open the text, not only is Jesus God, I certainly and many of you believe that, but that he's also the most keen intellect who's ever lived and the greatest lover of people who's ever walked the planet. So we take pride week after week of going, hey, what, what, what can we learn from Jesus as it relates to this whole experience of being human and a leader and a parent and a spouse and a classmate and a teammate? That's hopefully what you've heard about us. And next week, we're going to start a series that very much goes in that track. Uh, we're going to start a series called Comparison Trap. We want to look at the, the carnage that comes with getting caught in this kind of invisible game of comparison. I think it'll be challenging and uplifting and in some ways freeing. But this week, I want to talk about our culture. And I want to talk about our culture because, because we've worked hard from day one to not assume there will be a year 10 or 11. Not because we don't want one, not because we're being irresponsible, and hopefully not because we're being entitled. But we've worked hard to go, listen, let, let's just be a church together until we're effective. As long as God is moving, as long as there's stories that... that capture the fact that lives are changing, as long as we're being used and your friends and neighbors actually can come and you're not embarrassed, let's keep doing this. You know, I had a meeting, or not wasn't a meeting, it was an interaction a couple weeks ago with a, a local business leader, and I want to protect his anonymity as much as I can. But he was sharing with me, uh, we, we don't know each other real well, but he was sharing with me that, that another uh, not-for-profit, not, like, uh, not unlike our own, uh, was He'd had a meeting with them, and that in this meeting, basically what this not-for-profit had said to him was, you, you need to write bigger checks to us, and here's why. And my friend, uh, he, he doesn't sell ice cream cones, but let's just say he does. He, he, sa he, he said, I, I ultimately looked at them and said, do, do, you, do you have any idea how many ice cream cones I have to sell to cut you that check? And to be honest with you, it was extraordinarily humbling to me, somewhat haunting as a person who, since I was 20 years old, make my living off of your kingdom tithe, it was, it was like, whew. And it was this reminder that the degree to which we exist is only when people like yourselves who are already busy and working your dogs off at home and in, in, in jobs believe and buy in. And so let's make sure that it's still worth our while. In those first few months, maybe, maybe it was within a year, I, I had a meeting with a, a guy who has become a good friend. He works for a multinational million, maybe billion dollar company. I'm not totally sure. And in those first few months, I, I was wrecked years, to be honest, first few years, uh, by, by the, the financial piece of all this. I'd worked for a big mega church up until this point. I always had money to spend and never had to worry about where it came from. And as a church planner, who, who was, we were given a lump, and, and then all of a sudden we were bleeding it and trying to pay attention. How often should I be looking at finances and how much detail and all of that? That This friend who works for this multinational, million-dollar company said, Adam, my responsibility in my local firm is to bring in tens of millions of dollars worth of work a year so that this huge staff of people ha has a job to do. And he said, and, and I... I can see three months, maybe six months of security, of job security. But if I stop doing what I'm doing, and it, for me it was this eye-opening thing, a multinational million-dollar company, if my friend stops doing what he's doing, he's like, in six months, I don't have a job. 
That, that, was, that made an impression on me. And I think that's part of what drives the psyche of Vision Weekend of going, hey, w- what if we just reevaluate, you reevaluate, and we make sure that we're not entitled and we don't get to exist just because we raise the Jesus banner, but we exist to the degree that we're, we're helpful. And I, I think that has everything to do with culture. So we've historically called this weekend Vision Weekend, though I'm starting to realize we probably need to come up with a new name. Uh, we've got a lollipop for anybody who comes up with a better one. Because Vision Weekend, to, to me, conjures up images much bigger than we ever do this weekend. We're, we're, we're not looking to save all the starving kids in Africa, not to trivialize that need, but that's not what we do. We're not rolling out a $20 million capital campaign. That's next week. <laughs> Just kidding. We're not trying to save a continent. We're not even trying to save Helena. In fact, what we've always done is to go, wait, wait a minute, I, what if we made our mission really, really small? The question that we like to return to on on Vision Weekend, and one that I hope is relevant in your own business and life and relationships and spiritual goals, is, is what, if, what if the daily leads to the dream? And, and what, if, what if the vision of what are we going to do as a church, what if that's the easy part? What if where the real evaluation has to happen is, is it still worth it? Do we still want to work this hard within the daily, weekly, monthly sacrifices that it takes for you and your family? Is it still something that, that is worth your while? A story that you've probably heard me tell one of my all-time favorites from one of my all-time favorite books uh, by a guy named Jim Collins is a story of Roald Amundsen and Robert Falcon Scott. I should learn how to pronounce the first guy's name because I tell this story so often, but there's just nothing natural about saying either the first or last name. Amundsen? These guys in, in October of 1911 uh, were finalizing plans to race one another and their respective teams on an epic journey to the South Pole and become the first people in the modern era to reach the South Pole on Antarctica. Uh, ultimately, Rold's crew won. They would arrive 34 days before Robert Falcon Scott's crew. And then they would turn around and they would arrive successfully back home before winter set in on the continent. Robert Falcon Scott's crew, of course, ha- had the horrible experience of arriving at their goal 34 days after their counterpart. In fact, by the time they got there, they say the, the flags were tattered. It's like the championship banner was already worn. It had been so long since the victors were there. They turned around and began an epic run and race for their life, and it was a race they ultimately lost. Every person on Robert Falcon Scott's crew ultimately froze to death before reaching back. It was a 1,400-mile journey, by the way. This is 1911. We don't have satellite phones. We don't have Gore-Tex. None of that stuff. Barely have a combustion engine, right? So the question becomes, why such a different outcome? Why why could two people, Rold was 39, Robert Falcon Scott was 42. Both had similar socioeconomic backgrounds. Both had all the same opportunities as it relates to training and preparation. How could they have such dramatically different outcomes? And of course, one of the things, and this is what Jim Collins does in his book, and I'm not kidding, this is like top three in my books ever, in a book called Great by Choice. It's on that mind map if you want to check that out. One of the things he notes is that there's a few things that, that Rold's crew did uniquely. One of them involves the approach. See, see, one of the crews, they decided that they would allow weather to dictate how far they went. And so on days where it was nice, again, it's Antarctica, so that's a relative statement. Uh, On days that were nice, they would cover 30, 40 miles in a day. And on days that weren't so nice, they would hunker down. On those days where it seemed dangerous to be outside, they wouldn't even leave their shelters. The other crew, they they had pre-decided, their leader had pre-decided, that they were going to meet their mark, uh, that they were going to win this race. Again, they left on almost the same day by going 20 miles every day. In fact, there were times where his crew uh, almost overthrew him because they were so frustrated because it was so nice and the conditions so ideal that it seemed to them that they should keep going. He refused. Part of his training involved time with the Eskimos. Part of what he learned that the Eskimos do is they move very methodically. They avoid working up a sweat because they understand that's what gets you killed. And so he always was kind of holding the reins on days that the weather was very nice. Conversely, on days where his counterparts weren't leaving their shelters, they still went 17, 18. They didn't always make their goal of 20 miles. But there were times where his crew wanted to quit. Turns out you can't quit when you're in the middle of Antarctica. Not if you want to live. Because they, they thought it was irresponsible that they were even going anywhere today. Now, of course, which crew do you suppose won? It's the 20-mile march crew. And part of what we've talked about for, for some time is, what, 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 again, what, what, what's your 20-mile march? 
And what if the great successful organizations that we see and admire, what if they define, what if they boil their goals down to these more tangible elements? In fact, what if we could say it this way? Go to that next slide. What if it's one thing to have a dream and it's quite another to translate a dream into a daily work ethic? What if it's one thing to want your business or your relationship with Jesus or your marriage or anything else to take on a certain pattern and quality and it's another thing to get up and do that something every day that'll get you to that goal? You have to um, deal with some baseball analogies this weekend. I know it's football season, but it's still baseball season. Billy Ripken, uh, the less famous brother of Cal Ripken Jr., played second base for the Orioles when his brother played shortstop and his dad was the manager. Imagine that. He's now very involved in youth baseball. I heard him say last year, he he said, and this just blows my mind. I I, I don't even know if it's hyperbole because it's so exacting. He said, "I I have still not met a Major League Baseball player who doesn't hit off the tee every day. Now, hitting off the tee is one of the most fundamental things of baseball. And here you have these guys making millions doing something that six-year-olds do. Ben Zobrist, though it pains me to put his picture up there, I think is perhaps uh, one of the most underrated baseball players in the league. I've heard him tell his story. He he says in the days leading up to his making it to the bigs, and he's one of those guys who made it uh, later into his 20s, played for a small Division II college. He said he was hitting 200 baseballs a day off a batting tee. He said he was the most boring date in the world for his wife when they were dating because whether it was Tuesday night or Friday night, he wasn't doing anything until he'd taken his 200 swings. Let me ask you this. What, what, if, what if Kate didn't come out of the shoot a world-class guitarist? You know? What, what, if, what if Rob wasn't born this phenomenal attorney? What if people like Annie and many of the moms around here didn't just naturally become these great moms? What if... Like, what if Lasso the Moon wasn't a can't-miss idea? And Amy, this phenomenal supernatural leader. What if all of those represent people who had an ambition, had a goal, and translated into some daily activity? Again, what if it's one thing to have the dream and quite another to translate it to those daily activities? I love the way Paul says this because I I think it didn't occur to me until recently how ironic what Paul says is. So in Galatians 6... Paul says something that I think is pretty easy to receive uh, unless you're on the bad end of it. But what Paul says, uh, let me just read it. He says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Uh, A man or a person reaps what he sows. So this is like you going, yeah, you don't get an A on a math test when you don't study for it. That's just how this thing works. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. My friend Fred used to always say, like, Adam, we know where this train ends. Like, if you, if you get on this one, you end up at a known destination. That's what Paul's saying here is, listen, there's things you do, you should know where that's taking you. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we reap a harvest if we not give, do not give up. Now, what, what Paul says is very American, isn't it? It's like, you get what you invest in. But here's the irony to me. Paul got himself killed for his insistence that God's primary leading attributes were things like grace and mercy. Paul got himself killed because he insisted to his peers, the Jews, that contrary to their theology, Gentile people, non-Jewish people, didn't have to get a certain kind of surgery and other things before they could receive God's grace. What got Paul killed was his insistence that God's grace is readily available to everybody if they're willing to receive it. So this Paul, who ultimately was trying to get before Caesar and got himself killed doing so, insisting that the world religions that declare you earn your way to God are wrong, that God's grace is bigger... This is the same Paul who goes, hey, but when it comes to your business, it comes to your relationships, you kind of get what you invest. It's paradoxical, isn't it? It's kind of, it, 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 it's ironic to me that a guy who so insisted grace also, as Dallas Willard insisted, that grace is a, it, it's opposed to earning, not to effort, seems to be what's going on here. Dave Ramsey says it this way. He's always got a little more edge to him. He says, what if most people fail uh, because they won't be excellent in the ordinary? Now, uh, I mean, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, like, like nobody becomes overweight on Thanksgiving, right? Have you ever thought of that? I mean, this is the laws of nutrition. And, 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 and I'm not, if you're sensitive there, I'm not trying to rub anybody's nose or anything. We all have our vices. Some are more visible than others. But nonetheless, like, n- n- nobody becomes overweight because they had a bad weekend, it, it, it's, it's a series of decisions. Nobody becomes an alcoholic because they went to the bar once. N- nobody becomes 
just completely hamstrung by credit card debt because of one purchase or even one vacation. It's, it's a series of things, right? What, what if we can flip this principle and actually make it empowering in our lives? Nobody becomes rich because of one thing, and you go, ah, the lottery. I read some statistics recently. Did you know that those who file for bankruptcy, though, excuse me, those who win the lottery are 10 times more likely to file for bankruptcy in their life and four times more likely to get a divorce? You know what I didn't understand as a 30-year-old church planner? I, I didn't understand uh, that getting discovered is not how people and organizations succeed. Like, we, we celebrate getting discovered, and I think things like The Voice play to that idea, that you're just awesome, 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 and if you can happen to get discovered, then everyone will know how awesome you are. What's more common, it would seem, is people who slowly grind it out and get to 50 years old and go, wow, I think we've got a successful business here. I, I was thinking about this in my own life. I, I, I don't, maybe it's a confession, but, you know, when we first started, we did these things we called preview services that summer of 2009. Last Sunday in June, July, and August, we hosted preview services at Cinemark. Uh, and then the, the, the following, in September, we did three gatherings every week. And then on the, the first Sunday in October, we did something called Grand Opening. In hindsight, that was the weekend I thought we were going to get discovered. We'd sent out 25,000 mailers. We had a billboard up. We, we, we had this kind of risky, edgy series that we were doing. I, I don't think we were on the radio yet, but I mean, that was the weekend I expected to get discovered. And go ahead to that slide, will you, Lisa? That at grand opening, our attendance was 235. And I was like, Katie, bar the doors. It's coming next week. Word is out. In October of 2009, our average attendance, go ahead to that next slide, was 177. Now, it's not about numbers, but I, I want to make a point here. And so then it's like the next discovery thing. That I, I knew that we had phenomenal musicians, great leadership, great hospitality team. And so the idea of hosting a Christmas Eve gathering here, which we were ultimately given permission to do, I, I, I knew we could serve people well. I was so excited for that. Christmas Eve 2009, we had 255 people. It's like, now we've been discovered. We'll be on the news. This is a big deal. January of 2010, our average attendance was 185. Next big thing, again, I'm just working through this now as I look in hindsight. It's like, well, if we could get out of the Cinemark, then we'll be discovered. And that was then that Grand Street very graciously allowed us to, to move from weekly gatherings at the Cinemark into this place. The first Sunday in September of 2010, we were here. Our attendance was 197. That year, we averaged 186. And I, and I have all these data points I could point you to where I kept going like, oh, we'll be discovered, oh, we'll be discovered. To whatever degree it's accurate, because I hopefully have a lot of decades left to, to be psychoanalytical of this uh, learning, realizing like, no, you, you, don't, you don't get discovered, do you? You grind it out. Listen, what, 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 if, what if the organizations you admire, the, the business leaders, the creatives, the, the artists, the parents, the, the marriages... The athletes, you'll probably watch this afternoon. What if they didn't get discovered? Well, what if it's very easy to misunderstand how they arrived at their success? Proverbs 6 says it this way. Uh, it talks about ants. I was going to buy you all an ant farm for Vision Weekend, but they're like $15 a piece, and I thought you're probably all the better that we don't do that. But in Proverbs 6, uh, the, the psalmist ironically uses the, the ant to make this point. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise, which you're going. The only thing I know about ants is I like to poison them, but nonetheless, stick, stick with it. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Uh, I learned something this week I didn't know. You, know. you know what? When you do a word study, you know what the word sluggard starts, what comes to the surface, what's behind the word sluggard? Go ahead to that next slide. Someone afraid of pain or someone afraid of hard work. I always thought a sluggard was just somebody who preferred to sleep. I didn't realize there was something emotional, more deeply emotional than that. A sluggard is someone who doesn't like pain. They don't like hard work. What if it's the data that leads to the dream? Now, you'll have to humor me on this one because uh, I'm about to sound very arrogant. But you know, you know why I love baseball? I, part of what I've been working out here is I've watched my family uh, both, uh, well, watch them fall in love with baseball is that I've realized this whole daily thing I learned it growing up playing this game called baseball. And I'm sure it translates to other sports, 
But I do think that in general, baseball is unique in that it's not a body type sport. It, 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 there, you watch a major league game. There's all kinds of body types on the field. It, it's, it's a diligence sport. Here, here's, here's my story, and this is going to sound arrogant, but I'll, hopefully I can make it less so when we're done. What, what I remember when I played baseball for the first time, I was six years old. I was on a t-ball team. Uh, we, were, we were Taco Johns. We were like turd brown. In the, er- in the era of fluorescent pink and green and blue. So we were the ugliest team on the planet. The following year, we were burnt orange. Again, in the 80s, when those were like the worst colors uh, imaginable. And we were, we were t-ballers. I, I was a chubby little kid with red cheeks that liked baseball. And, but I loved baseball. And I started to work on baseball. And by the time I was 10 years old, in hindsight, I I was decent. We were a little league town, and in in our town, uh, they only drafted as many 10-year-olds as it took to fill their 11- and 12-year-old rosters, and I was the first one drafted. But in league, I was horrible. I was 10 amongst about 11- and 12-year-olds. At 11, I'd worked hard on pitching. That was kind of my thing. And at 11 years old, I was the number two pitcher on a team that took fourth in a 64-team tournament. The city tournament in Billings is huge. It was the furthest the Laurel team had ever made it. When I was 12, I was pitching in in all-stars and decent. When I was 13, I was, by that point, in hindsight, one of the better kids, if not the best kid in my, in my age or among a few. By the time I was 14, moving into high school, I, my, my conversations with my family were about junior, playing some junior college ba- baseball. Listen, I wasn't that good, but I thought, like, I, th- I think I can go to Coeur d'Alene and play for a couple of years and maybe pay for some college. The Legion coach approached my family uh, about me skipping my last year of Little League and, and trying out for Legion. I did. There were 72 kids who tried out. 36 made it. I, as a 15-year-old, made it. My first game that I started pitching, I was quivering in my shoes. It was at Cobb Field in Billings before they tore it down and built Dealer Park. And the guy that was starting for the Scarlets was drafted by the Dodgers just about a month prior. When I exited the game, uh, the game was tied because I threw so darn slow that they couldn't hit it. (laughs) That's when the wheels kind of fell off. Things went south for me. I started paying attention to to drugs and alcohol, frankly, not baseball. My family life kind of deteriorated. My my training partner went through a divorce. There was all kinds of things that occurred. When I was 16, I played, but I didn't pitch despite the new coaches. When I was 17, I decided I wanted to pitch again and I wasn't good at all. When I was 18, I didn't go out. In fact, I realized one of my more recurring dreams, this is weird, I, is that I dream that I went back, I, I have this weird dream that I went out for baseball after my summer of my senior year. But here's what stands out to me. I, I think I've totally misunderstood what happened. I think up until just a few weeks ago, I misunderstood why I succeeded and why I failed. I think for a long time, I thought I was good at baseball. In fact, my emotional dealings with it when I, when I stopped playing and wasn't as effective as I was, I, I up until a few weeks ago thought that what happened was my athleticism or lack thereof caught up with me and I became less good. I also think I've misunderstood my failure. P- part of what stands out to me, no, nobody came to me when I didn't play my senior year and went like, hey, you should play. That tells me something. I wasn't good anymore. I, I, I think that For the longest time, I thought I ran out of athleticism, and I thought I was successful because I was athletic. I'm realizing that none of that was true. It probably speaks to your success in business or in marriage. Now what I see was there was a season of my life where I invested daily in my outcomes on the baseball field. And at 15 years old, I stopped. And what's crazy for me to think is the start of that season, I was pitching against a kid who had been drafted. By the end of the season, we made the state tournament. I didn't even play. That's how fast it came unraveled for me. What if, what if you're not talented? What if that's even freeing that you don't have to be talented? Let's qualify what we mean there. What, what if it's not the most intelligent people who succeed? Or the most, you, you see where this goes. What if it's a translation to the daily? My friend Derry Long, uh, he likes to use dominoes to illustrate this point. He says what often happens to people when the wheels fall off is they have this sense of like, wait a minute, how did this happen? I mean, I went from here to here overnight, for better and for worse. He said, actually, it, it never happens overnight. Dave Ramsey says the distance between where you are and where you want to get is never a straight line. It's always curved. It's the same kind of idea. What Derry says is what actually what happens is every day you're making these little tiny choices And they're easily taken for granted and easily missed because it's not really getting you anywhere. And then all of a sudden, something does happen, and finally there's this tipping point. And in a moment's notice, you're all of a sudden like, wait a minute, how did we get all the way over here? 
You've probably been insulted by this. People have looked at you and went like, how did your, how, your business look so easy? How did it get here? And you know what they don't understand? All those days when the lights weren't on and you were making these little decisions that seemed to be taking you nowhere, right? This is in marriage. Listen, what, 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 if, what if one of the most terrifying principles in the world is also one of the most empowering? What if one of the most empowering principles in the world is also one of the most terrifying? I have this kind of emotional thing that goes through my head every year around this time. Like, okay, Lord, what if this is the end of our run? Can I emotionally handle that? What if we suddenly stink? What if suddenly nobody wants to come? And then there's this piece of God that goes like, well, are you willing to work still? Is your staff willing to work? Do you still care deeply about this? We're okay. You know, when you think of the Civil War, I mean, not that you've done that lately. I mean, there would be no reason to. (laughs) We think of Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, right? The two big generals, the North and the South. And in fact, uh, I'm not an expert, but, but, I, but I've been learning a lot about the dynamics of the Civil War. We, we think, uh, like they did, that the war rested upon the big battle and winning the big battle. What's less known is that many historians would say William T. Sherman, a lesser known general, is far more responsible for the outcome of the Civil War than anybody else. Now, Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, it's true. Both of them were looking for Lord of the Rings-type epic battles and convinced that whoever won those battles was going to win the war. William T. Sherman was this very humble guy who, in the background, didn't want to be in charge but kept kind of whispering to people like Lincoln, I don't think that's how we win the war. In fact, it's kind of controversial now. He essentially was, was an early innovator of total warfare. What William T. Sherman said is, I think we need to stop standing around and building these big armies and waiting for the big battles. I think we need to take a smaller crew of guys, break through enemy lines, exist off the land so we don't have this big infrastructure, and every day do things to destroy the South's ability to keep fighting. Light fields on fire, destroy factories. I mean, it, it it was a form of terrorism. That's why it's controversial today. His strategy was, we'll just slowly make our way through the South, decimate the infrastructure, and make it impossible, or at least destroy the will of people to fight. One of the things that he would do is they would light these massive fire on the South's railroad tracks, and then when the rails were hot enough, they would lift the rails, and they would like wrap them around trees and things. Apparently, you can still see them in the South. They're called Sherman's neckties. He eventually reached Atlanta. From Atlanta, he begged for permission to march to the sea, it's called, and that's what he did. And in the end, what he had done is completely decimated the infrastructure behind the South's army. So yeah, ultimately, a couple generals, they get all the attention. Many historians would go, no, it, it was a guy who was doing something every day with a small group of people that led to the outcome that ultimately happened. So here's my question. What's your 20-mile march? I don't know what your dreams are. I don't know where you're trafficking right now, whether you're thinking lots about you and Jesus or your business or your marriage or your kids or all of the above. What's, what's, what's your 20-mile mark? What, what are the things that you have to do every day to get there? Because around here, it's, it's kind of boringly, it's kind of boring. It's the same. Our, our, our commitment, what we're going to do is what we've done. We're going to gather on Sundays and hopefully create gatherings that, that you would be thrilled to invite uh, the most weirded-out church person you know. And we're going to find ways to tangibly serve people about once a month. But what, what's your 20-mile march? What's, what's the end point and what are the things that you have to do every day? In just a moment, we're going to watch a video from a gal who I, I think glorifies God in the way she's done this in her own journey with Jesus. She models that, that it's one thing to get excited about what Jesus can do in your life. It's another thing to, to lay the groundwork every day for years and allow him to begin to tangibly get you there. Let me pray and we'll watch that. Lord, Thanks, God, for your grace uh, that we don't have to earn it. Thanks, God, that you made us to work. Uh, That your intention was never that we just kind of miraculously arrive at great things and great success, but that we're most full and most connected to you when we're putting our hands on the soil and translating your kingdom to daily decisions and moments in our lives and in our world. We love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.